ladies and gentlemen, Gary Moore. Thank you. Hi. Good to see you. Welcome to the Tell the Truth. Patty, you want to take a close-up shot of my new haberdashery here? For a conservative fellow like me, that's a pretty jazzy tie. Lime green, electric blue, and all that. And this is a creation of one of the country's most distinguished designers of clothes for men, a gentleman who believes that men's clothes should be bright and brilliant and far out, and he is, needless to say, our first guest today. We'll meet him as soon as we've said hello to our panel here on To Tell the Truth. Bill Pollan. Anita Gillette. Orson Bean. And Kitty Carlisle. Orson, I'm glad you didn't say that on the air. <laughs> But Orson came out, took one look at my necktie, and what did you say? I said, your tongue is coated. <laughs> isn't that terrible? That's a good-looking tie, isn't it? I like that. It would go I good really with my blue jacket. That's a good-looking one. Now, we're going to start right out by meeting... You need That's a good one. A ragu. Spaghetti. Now, let's meet our designer of clothes for men. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Alexander Shields. Number two. My name is Alexander Shields. Number three. My name is Alexander Shields. Good heavens, it's a colorful group. Yeah. All right, let's find out which one of these eye-catching gentlemen is indeed Alexander Shields. Here is his story. I, Alexander Shields, design, manufacture, and sell clothes for men. I am proud to say that many of the fashion trends of today have been part of my designs for many years. I have taken fashions from other cultures and made them part of the at-home wardrobe for men. Garments such as kimonos, kaftans, and floor-length rajah coats. I feel the American man should look tall and slender. With this goal in mind, I have designed a classic, easy-fitting, no-button jacket. This is just one of my fashion innovations. I am also responsible for getting the American male out of drab and colorless garments into sports clothes that are both comfortable and colorful. My clothes are considered suitable by all fashionable men, from the most conservative to the greatest swingers. To prove the point, my creations are worn by both Barry Goldwater and Frank Sinatra. Signed, Alexander Shields. <laughs> And while we're putting on our sunglasses, we'll be right back after a few commercials. Okay. The problem at hand seems to be that each of these multi-hued gentlemen claims to be Alexander Shields, designer of elegant outfits for men. Now, why don't we start the question with our own very conservatively garbed fashion plate today, Orson Bean. Thank you, Gary. Yes. Number one, can you run fast in that dashiki? Because well, you might have to. <laughs> I can imagine you, you know, flying through the inner city of Newark and that pursued by an angry mob. <laughs> can't run very fast. can't run fast, all right. Uh, number three, now, uh, do you ever feel that you may uh, be participating in the opening of a Pandora's box? I mean, man is basically vainglorious by nature. You, you may have us all with powdered wigs again. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Well, well, well but it's in, after hundreds of years of, of this sort of thing, to go to that is an enormous well, step, isn't it? I haven't changed my style and fashions in almost 20 years. You've been I, wearing that that long, that kind of stuff? Well, not this particular. No, I know that. But uh, I've been manufacturing the same yeah. styles and same fashions, I'd say, for the last 20 years. Oh, that's wild. Number two, that Mickey Mouse tie you have on now. I know that those, uh, <laughs> those ties, the big ties, are really coming back. Uh, uh, well, I call, I call the, this two. I, ca I call this the ascot. Oh, combination of So do I, number three. I'm not a complete dummy. <laughs> combination <laughs> of ascot and a stock. It doesn't, it doesn't slip. I sell it for seven fifty, anywhere between seven fifty yeah. and ten dollars. All right, now back to two and your Mickey Mouse tie. Yes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> With no button on that thing, what do you do if it gets chilly? You just uh, hope for the no best. No button on the coat. Yeah. Stand up straight. Stand up straight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Orson. Let's go to Kitty. 
Well, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I bought uh, clothes 20 years ago in your shop from my husband. So, but I, I don't know what you look like. Uh, do you buy your own fabrics, number three? Yes. You do? Uh, number two, uh, you say that you design, those are sports clothes. What kind of sports do you perform and what you're wearing? <laughs> Number huh? two, this no, is... No, number one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, this is not meant for sports activity. What's uh, it meant for? More indoors or to wear on your patio on the Riviera or to have a penthouse in New York. Oh, my. It sounds <laughs> as though you have a rich clientele. Number two, are your clothes very expensive? No, they're not. They're not? Like what? Uh, they run in the average price of menswear today. Well, what? That, that's a wide range. Uh, I don't want to pin you down. All right. No. Number I'm, three, where do you get your fabric? I get my fabrics here in this country, and also uh, I use imported fabrics. And number two, do you have kind of a hippie-style place now? I haven't been in your shop in so long. Do you no, have music don't. and hippie salespeople? No. What no. kind are they? No, we set a style rather than a fashion, and I think the style has endured. It's, and what is it? Uh, the style of Alexander Shields. Nice. <laughs> Take that. All right, Bill. Oh, yeah. Well, I, uh, I have met Mr. Shields, and I have contributed mightily to his establishment through the years. Well, you've obviously <laughs> bought all your clothes. Well, you do not all, but for two very good reasons. His clothes are sensational. And the last time I were there, the salesmen are not. They're, they're very nice-looking girls in mini skirts, and they sit down while you pick the fabric. And when you finish picking the fabric, you... anyway, I have to disqualify myself. But I'll be, I'll be up at the shop, which is a grand shop, very shortly. Well, I enjoyed it's your little daydream there, Bill. Thank yes. you. And so he disqualified himself, and that counts as one wrong vote. And so we go to Anita Gillette. Boy, that doesn't help me at all. <laughs> Number two, where is your shop located? On Park Avenue in New York City. On Park Avenue in New York City. Number three, uh, uh, is that the kind of thing that you would wear around the house? Is that what you call an at-home fashion? Uh, not particularly, no. I, I'd say this is more for outdoors. Outdoors? Yes. People would really see you coming, wouldn't they? Yes, yes, they, would. yes they would. Electric colors. Number one, is that an at-home fashion that you have on? Yes, I would say. Primarily. Can you relax in that thing? <laughs> uh, if you like the buttons open. <laughs> oh, you, you mean you unbutton it to relax. <laughs> I see. Or do anything that you would do around the house. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, uh, is... is uh, and the tuxedo wear, do you approve of those frilly shirts? No, I don't. I've, what I'm wearing is a dinner jacket. It's a, my version of a tuxedo. Oh, that's your... A little brighter your... color, yes. I see. And, Worn and with dinner trousers. What, do, you, do you have a stripes down the side of anything? Of the trousers. Matches the uh, Mickey Mouse bow tie. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. Okay. I'm sorry our questioning time is up, but I'm as anxious as you to find out who's the real one. What about it? What do you think at home? Is it number one? Or is it number two? Or is it number three? It's going to cost you $50 if you were playing the game and you got a wrong vote. $500 if all the votes are wrong. And Orson Bean, are you fashioning some delightful creation of your own? Yes, I am, Gary. I, I think that number two said that, uh, you know, his stuff is not expensive, but it's all a man. I, I ate with a guy in a really, one of New York's incredible restaurants. He says, well, this place is a real bargain. All you can eat for $1,000. Depends <laughs> on how you... Uh, I wound up voting. I, I was set to vote for three. I almost had my crayon down, but I changed it to when he made fun of his own clothes about the Mickey Mouse thing. Only a guy who, who, who was sure enough of himself to make these great things could make fun of them. All right, there's a bow tied vote for number two, and we go to Kitty Carlisle. Well, I voted for number two for a very simple reason. Uh, when they were standing there and saying their names, number two looked at his two side imposters very, very proprietarily. And admiring his own clothes. So I... <laughs> Good idea. All right, there's two for two, and Bill Cullen to disqualification, and uh, Anita Gillette. Well, I voted for number two also, and I voted for him. Uh, Hi, Anita. Uh, well, d oh, don't ask me, Orson, you know, because I really thought it was, it was number three, because, you know, he started telling about the tie and everything, mm. but he says that he believes in clothes should make men look tall and thin and everything, and I believe if I were a designer and I were small, I would say I should think clothes should be for small men, but he said tall men, so I picked number two. Oh. Everybody still out there? Well, All right. Well, done. That was beautiful. For every reason, yeah, like a book of the month. <laughs> yes, it almost, almost made me cry. That was so lovely. All right, well, our panel is going way out on a limb. We've got one disqualification from Bill Cullen, and we have three votes for number two. Will the real Alexander Shields please stand up? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Shields. Let's check with number one. You're, you're, you're lucked out, sir. What is your real name and what do you do? Uh, my name is Alan Hughes. I'm a sales VP for Film TV Daily. Well, you got a good job. And number three, sir, what is your real name, please, and what do you do? My name is Stanley Wirth. I'm a musician, and I have the band at the Pierre for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shields, we've established that your shop is here in New York, but if you can't shop in New York, where, may, where else may we find your clothes? I think we're in the finest store in just about every city in the country. But you pretty much cities. cover America. Yes. Right? Okay. We, we've had just a tiny, tempting glimpse of Mr. Shields' designs already, but we'd like to sample some more of his creations, so if you'll do the narration, we have some models and some pretty jazzy styles. Here are some of the highlights, my newest collection of Jetaway clothes for men. New fabrics, new ideas, new colors, new combinations. All to set a style, not a fashion. The emphasis is on comfort, with my basic feeling that less is more. Tom wears my long Roman stripe Raja. It is designed with nonchalance at its best to be worn all weekend as you play at home or around the pool. The long Raja promises to take the place of the outdated bathrobe and the recently demised kimono. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Doug wears my convertible wow. collar, fly front sport shirt, an Alexander Shields horizontal stripe signature square end necktie and a no-button jacket of handsome silk tussock. It is woven in my favorite happy colors, Kelly Royal and Lemon, and has a royal lining to match. Show us, Doug. The Lemon Irish Linen Trousers complete the perfect setup. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Ted, Ted wears a great all-knitted golfer. The navy blue greenbrier jacket is a ribbed wool jersey worn over an apple green lightweight polyester knitted turtleneck. The stretch wool double knit trousers are in a matching green and white plaid. This is a sure way to improve your game. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> Lastly, Tom wears my grown up version of a little boy's sun suit, a thirsty, double thick woven terry. It's a great, comfortable design for after swim or after anything. Thanks, Tom. And that's our capsule fashion show of Alexander Shields' Jetaway clothes, especially put together for To Tell the Truth. Thank you all. Lord Chancellor Alexander Shields and friends, thank you for being with us on To Tell the Truth. I kind of had a feeling the audience thought that with that last outfit, he should have a little pail and a shovel. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. He's cute. Well, let's continue with our high living style while we're at it. Our next guest is a gentleman who likes to eat. And he is so fond of food that he considers it very important to prepare something very special for dinner, even when he is dining alone. And we'll meet him after some mouth-watering messages. Last year... Barbecue fast. So, you mind if I smoke? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, I uh, listened to the panel chatting during the commercials. I have an idea we're headed for disaster, but maybe not. Let's find out. Let us meet our gourmet guest. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Sandy Lesberg. Number two. My name is Sandy Lesberg. Number three. My name is Sandy Lesberg. All right, here is Sandy Lesberg's story. Listen as I read it. I, Sandy Lesberg, am a broadcast, a radio broadcaster, writer, critic. However, the world of food has always been a pet interest of mine. I have just written a special cookbook for a man or woman who lives alone and likes it. My book gives hundreds of recipes I consider equally delicious when eaten alone or served to an honored guest or feasted upon by a large gathering. Unlike most bachelor recipes, mine involve a great deal more than opening a can or defrosting a package. As a matter of fact, many of them come from famous restaurants around the country, restaurants where I personally have wined and dined. I call my book of bachelor recipes The Single Chef's Cookbook, signed Sandy Lesberg. <laughs> All right.
right, let's start our questioning with Kitty Carlisle. Thank you, Gary. Well, that's a gentleman after my own heart. I guess you agree with a great friend of mine who, when I went to see her one day, was cooking an elaborate meal, and I said, who's coming to dinner? She said, nobody. I said, what are you doing all this for? She said, my stomach doesn't know I live alone. Yeah. <laughs> that's marvelous. Uh, number three, how long does it take you to make a souffle? Oh, about uh, 20 minutes. And number two, if you're, uh, if you're wanting to hold it back, if you have a phone call or something, what do you do? Take it off the stove away from the heat. Oh, you do? Uh-huh. Uh, number one, how do you make a bechamel sauce? Well, actually, I don't consider myself to be a cook. I'm more oh. of a collector of recipes. Oh, you don't it, cook for yourself? When it comes to cooking, I have to get someone else to be the single chef. <laughs> a girl, maybe? If possible. <laughs> uh, number three, but you do cook. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to Bill Cullen. Number three, you cook, is that right? Yes. Uh, what is a roux, number three? R-O-U-X roux. It's a herb. Uh, number, number one, we'll get back to the souffle. Number two said, uh, I'm addressing this to number one, that uh, number three said, I think, that a souffle takes 20 minutes to work, uh, to cook. Do you agree with that? Well, I think it would depend on how fast you wanted to make it. Uh, number two, uh, do, do people generally prefer their souffle soft in the center or dry all the way through? Crisp. A big pardon? Cri oh, I prefer it crisp. A uh, crisp. Number three, do you hold with the souffle situation? Crisp. Number one, you call this a single man's cook, but a single chef's cookbook. Now, what's the difference between that and somebody who's married and cooks? I mean, what is the difference in the recipes for it? Well, I think the single chef is someone who would cook more for himself than for uh, his family or friends, Okay, Bill, thank you. And Anita? Well, I'm sorry, because I had a lovely interview with this gentleman once, and I remember him quite well, and I'm very pleased to know he's such a good cook. <laughs> so you're <laughs> But I have to disqualify myself, I'm sorry. Well, earlier on, when I said I had a feeling we were headed for disaster, I heard the panel saying, Sandy Lesberg, Sandy Lesberg, I think I know him. He's very well known in broadcasting circles, but in radio mostly. And I thought possibly all four of you were going to disqualify. And I was wondering what to do with the next 27 minutes. <laughs> but we've got one disqualification from Anita, and we go to Orson. You still have your guitar around, Gary? No, oh, oh, you want to hear me sing? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, number two, now, uh, isn't it kind of sad to cook an elaborate meal for yourself, sit there all alone and polish it off, belch, pick your teeth, and uh, wash the dishes and go to bed and cry yourself to sleep on your pillow? Not if, <laughs> not if you do all of it in style, no. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think it's a lot sadder to go home and take a can of spaghetti off the shelf and look at it and say, oh, another one. Or make a, I think the saddest thing is to make yourself a ham sandwich and look at the walls. You can't uh, really, I think, uh, start being happy if you happen to live alone. Well, number one, isn't it better to go out and eat in horn and hard arts and stare at the other miserable people? Well, I do that from time to time also. Do you do that? That's interesting. Where can you get for a nickel there anymore? I guess nothing. Everything number three. What's the, what's the finest, simple recipe in your book? Uh, bourbon brownies. Bourbon brownies? Bourbon brownies. Uh -oh. Okay, that's all the questioning time. We, I remember I once my wife first. left town, and I cooked for myself, and I did fine for the first five days, and I couldn't cook for myself anymore, because every recipe I tried uh, started with, take a clean dish. <laughs> I never did. <laughs> couldn't handle it. So it's voting time anyway. You must vote for number one, or you vote for number two, or you vote for number three. Fifty dollars goes down the drain with each wrong vote. Five hundred dollars in the event of a deluge of wrong votes. And Kitty, you want to post your opinion? Well, I'm in a very tough spot because number three said a roux was an herb and it's not. Uh, number one um, goes to Horn and Hardest once in a while, and I don't believe that. And number two said he likes his souffles crisp. And I don't believe that either, but I had to vote for somebody, so I voted for number two. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be in the middle, you voted for number two. All right, Bill Cullen? I'm not a gourmet chef, but I do know my souffles. And you know, number two also said that if someone walks in, you take it out of the stove. You never do oh, that. Oh, never. No, mine is a negative vote. Number two and number three, after what they did for a souffle, even if they're the right one, I'm voting for number one. <laughs> Because they kill the souffle. One souffle. angry souffle vote for yes. number one. And a disqualification from Anita, Gillette, and Orson. Well, I, I think that if you live alone long enough, you're like a, uh, a hard souffle. So I'm voting for number two. I mean, strange things happen to you when you live alone. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I agree. All right, let's, let's find out about this. Well, the real Sandy Lesberg. 
please stand up. Hey! Let's check with number one from Horn and Hardy. What, what, what is your real name, please? My what real name is Paul Grebin, and I'm a physical education instructor at the New York City Police Academy. Oh. How about that? <laughs> and number three, we're the wrong rule. What is your real name, sir? What do you My do? name is Simon Newey, and I'm the fashion coordinator for the advertising Needham, Harper, and Steers. Kitty Carlisle has her hand up. I yes, wanted to send number three. You probably meant, thought we met R-U-E, which is a nerve. True. Of course. There you go. Oh, Would you vote. care to have five seconds, <laughs> Sandy, to defend your souffle? Well, I'll go with Orson. Sometimes when you live alone, which I don't want anymore, you'll settle for hard souffle. Oh. <laughs> There's a no, weasel no, answer a if I ever heard it. Do you have a souffle recipe in there, Sandy? Not anymore, Bill. Good, because I'm, I'm going to get the we gotta, page number tear it out. <laughs> we got to run. Take what? Well, he's holding up a sign saying book. I held up book. You got a new book. You got a new book? What's a new book? Yeah, there's a Christmas book called Specialty of the House, and this is a compilation of recipes from 450 restaurants around the world. We got the chef to give us their real chef d'oeuvre, and I, it's pretty interesting. That should and be exciting. Any souffles in this? They're courtesy of the chef, not me. Yeah. Sandy, we're already one and a half programs over. Thank you very much for being with us, and thank you, imposters, for being with us on To Tell the Truth. <laughs> Promotional consideration provided by American Airlines. Traveling on business or traveling for fun, it's good to know you're on American Airlines. This is Johnny Olson speaking for To Tell the Truth, a Mark Goodson, Bill Todman production.